Welcome to Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. In this podcast, I chat to athletes, coaches, and industry professionals about their sporting journey and the lessons they've learned along the way. Guests range from Olympians to the everyday lover of sport, but the message stays the same. There is so much more to sport than what meets the eye. Make sure you hit subscribe on Apple Podcasts or follow on Spotify so you don't miss the release of each new episode. You can also find us on Facebook and Instagram at Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. I'd love to hear from you. Before introducing this week's guest, I'm jumping in to let you know about a special Instagram giveaway happening right now. Brooke Stratton, Olympic long jumper and guest in season one, has kindly donated part of her 2016 Rio Olympic uniform to one special follower. With Tokyo coming up and Brooke literally jumping onto her second Olympic team, what a special piece of memorabilia. Head over to our Instagram page at Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart to enter. Entries close on Sunday the 30th of May at 10am Melbourne time. Read through the Instagram post to check out all the terms and conditions. Good luck. Welcome to part two of my interview with the incredible Janice Crosswhite. If you haven't heard part one yet, hit pause now and go listen to the first part for some very important context. In this episode, Janice takes us through the evolution of sporting opportunities between the generations and how she's played a major part in that. Janice has been on multiple boards for women's participation and education in sport, and you can find the link to the ones she's mentioned in the show notes. We also go through some of the local community projects Janice has played a major role in, and again, our love for Labradors comes up. Janice also gives us her thoughts on the future of sport. How does it feel seeing like the opportunities you had as a as a kid growing up versus opportunities mm. that your daughters have had and then now that your granddaughters have got, does it feel like, I guess, quite special or like a sense of pr- like pride knowing that you've had a, a bit of a part in the potential that, that, you know, they can go to? Yeah, it's certainly today. There are some women have got lots more scope for high-level sport and, and opportunities along the way, like mm-hmm. you know, even from junior sport to um, senior sport, then to international sport. Yeah, if, if I could have, you know, been able to be, got the softball field to a scholarship back in the 60s, I would have had that. Yeah, um, but they went around, you know, that was my first sport, and you know, I was at that very high level. Um, and yet, I can see. My daughters have done that. The eldest daughter, Carol, went to dance in college on a basketball team. Second daughter, went to the AIS, went to Virginia University, and she did only two degrees there, captain the team, finished with a master's there. And then Sunny and went to the AIS first of all, and then on to Oregon University for four years. Wow. So um, children certainly had those opportunities and now we'll, we'll see what happens with, you know, the, the grandchildren are too young. But as I said, Adidas already had three universities for the states of go to early contact mm-hmm. going there on a rowing scholarship. Now, if she continues with rowing from 17 to 18 to 19, who knows? With softball, there was only seen softball champion. Well, I got to 16, I did under 16. Well, there was only senior women's. They didn't start till I think 58 or 59, the first Australian basketball championship. And then while I was teaching at Princeton Tech in the early 60s, we started the first ever under 18 girls basketball championships. The first one was in Adelaide. And I was the manager of the team. And um, for the first four years, until I got married, I managed the Victorian under-18 girls basketball team. Wow. That's it was, but now that's just, there's now under-14s, there's under-16s, there's under-20s, you know, right through all the age groups in most sports. So, yep. um, you know, there, there just wasn't in my day. And one of the benefits of that, though, Theo, is we didn't get as injured. 
mm-hmm. because we weren't training as well. The hours, well, we didn't have the courts, the basketball to get onto to start with. It was only yeah. Albert Park. We used to train six o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock for our women's team because that was the only time on a weekend we could get on. And everybody worked during the week, so you didn't have midweek training. You played on a Wednesday night uh, and you trained twice on a weekend, and that was it. So that's one of the things I noticed with my grandchildren is the early injury toll in their teens mm-hmm. while they're growing. And, uh, and actually my five grandchildren in Sydney um, for their Christmas present was their um, Thermogun. Oh, how so good are they? <laughs> Well, I've never used one, but I've read about them and, and I thought this is something they can all use, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and they are using it. And um, but they, they regularly get injured, all of them, and I think some of them are overuse injuries. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, 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 and also the skill level today is higher. Whatever you look at in junior sport, I just get a stand and I say that. They know everything by the time they're 15 and 16. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. When you look back, um, even the kids that I see coming up in swimming, I'm like, oh, gosh, like you're doing so much better and you're, you're three years younger yeah. than what I was that, doing that. And yeah. I'm like, oh, yeah. gee, like you're making me feel a little bit funny. <laughs> but yeah. it's, yeah, um, it's really it. good to see that evolution. And I guess in terms of the injuries, I think it's maybe a bit of a sports science thing. And then we just need to educate the coaches. Well, I think that that's just ongoing. That's just ongoing. And that's, well, that's one of the things we need is more female coaches. So I'm pleased to hear your coaching, Fiona, because <laughs> that is what's lacking mm-hmm. in, in many Western countries, and well, not only Western, but across the world, is um, the lack of, we've got more women in leadership positions, more on boards, uh, more in management and administration, certainly more out on the playing field. But behind that is the coaches, and that's what we have to do to to grow our standards and yep. and have safe sport. I think that's what, what's important. My mum actually sent me this podcast, so I can't remember the name, but I was listening to a podcast from, I think she, she was a doctor either in the UK or the US. I can't remember who was the host and mm. who was the expert, but she actually said that all the sports science is actually based on male bodies yeah. And so there's a huge lack of the sports science for female bodies. So coaches mm. who do read this data, and I'm going to say male coaches who don't go through the highs and lows of a female monthly cycle, mm. they're not going to know that there's some weeks you can push your body and some weeks you can't. And there's some weeks mm. your hormones will literally, oh, what did she, she quoted? There's a certain time of the month you're more prone to an ACL injury. Yeah. yeah. And like male coaches, like they haven't personally experienced that and there's no real literature out there to say it mm. yet. So like it's yeah, just think- starting. Yeah, mm. it's just starting. Like on tonight's one of the television news, um, Deakin University, I think it's Deakin, playing AFL women's, you're nine times more likely to do an ACL than a male player. Mm. And why is that so? So they've looked at every ACL injury over the four years the leg's been going and the circumstance. I think concussion is another issue where, again, all the research mainly has been done on male sports injuries yeah. and, and not on female athletes. And, um, and the ACL is the other classic one. Yeah. What one daughter's done both knees in basketball and one other daughter's done one ACL through basketball. They're really common injuries now in high performance netball basketball and, mm-hmm. and Aussie rules as we're finding out. Yeah. Actually two of our season two guests had ACL injuries. Um Maddie Hogan, who is yeah. an Olympic javelin thrower, and Steph Kershaw, who is a hockey roo. So like yep. You know, we're, we're 10, 10 episodes in. We've got two already females with ACL injuries. Um, and they, you're out for a year. You know, mm. it's it's not a good injury to get. Yeah, and it's a big rehab. And they say, that, like, you're more likely to do the other knee if you've done one. Yeah. So, yeah, it's yeah. 
bit, bit uh, of a uh, bad one. And the worry is with osteoporosis in later life, they're saying, and instability. I, I've just finished the other week reading Megan Rapinoe's book, who's, I think she's still the captain of the USA soccer team or a co-captain. She was co-captain at the last Olympics. She's done, had three ACLs so far. Uh, she's now in the 30s. Mm, yeah, and like she's only 30. Early 30s. I think she was 30 in um, in Rio. Yeah. So, Under 35. Yeah, yeah wow. That, that, I recommend you read that book. Yeah, I'll have to uh, look it up. <laughs> yeah, no, it's a very good read about advocacy for gay rights and gender equality and then racism. Yeah. She's really, um, you know, and, and the story of how the USA women's soccer team fought USA Soccer Federation for equal pay and uh, the battle they went on. And very similar to the Matildas here, mm -hmm. uh, um, they fought to get better pay and they didn't get equal pay. But um, eventually the Matildas here went on strike to increase their pay rates and get better treatment from their soccer federation. So it's a very similar story. Um, but it's, it's a very well written, a very simple book, easy book to read. So have a, get it from the library. <laughs> yeah, I'll have to. I'll have to get onto it. Now, I'm going to ask you another another question, and I'm going to phrase it in: If there was one lesson that you could tell your grandkids who are just starting their like sporting journey and life journeys, I guess, what would that be? To enjoy the journey to enjoy the whole pathway, whatever it is, whatever you want to do. And, yeah, don't take it all that seriously, although mm -hmm. I know most people do <laughs> in competitive sport, but to enjoy it, to enjoy the people you're with, that you play with, and I think also to enjoy the people you play against. Yeah. And I think that's, that's one of the things through master sport that you appreciate you've got somebody to play against as you get older. And even though you might be on, you know, different sides of the bench, you you share a lot in common. Yeah. And I know a lot of coaches, and I've reacted against this in state teams today. That, and it's again, it's probably more basketball teams. Are you not allowed to talk to the opposition? You know, and even in club teams, no, nope, they're the enemy. We don't talk to them. We've got to beat them. Mm. We don't have anything to do with them. And there's this sort of attitude around at times. And, and I don't agree with that, that, um, you know, you're all in the big game of sport together and um, the values of sport are about, I think, you know, that fun, friendship and fitness, very basic stuff. Yeah. And, uh, you've got to enjoy it and, and you've got to enjoy it from both sides of the court and both sides of the net. But I think that that, that attitude comes out more in team sport than in individual sport. Yeah, no, I, I really like that friendship element, even though they might not be on your team. I know when I was swimming, I'd be cheering for people I went to school with, even though they were yeah. technically on a different swim team, but they were my friends. So mm -hmm. I didn't care what color cap they wore and, you know, what team they represented or club they represented. It, they were my friends. I went to school with them. So I was going to cheer them and I was going to cheer the person who was technically on my team or club in the lane next to them. And I didn't care what colour hat they wore, but people looked at me a little bit funny sometimes and my mum was like, oh, Fee, I'm, I'm really proud that you're such a good sport and you don't care what, what caps people are wearing. Yeah. First time I played against a transgendered person mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, and it was, I understood her history. She explained it all and I won't go into that. Uh, and I was trying to explain to my team that she has every right to play and while it made a difference to the result of this game, we just have to accept that. I was seen as befriending the enemy rather than befriending a fellow player. Mm. And, um, and so we still have a lot of education about transgender in sport because even though these were Australian Masters Championships and that team did eventually win the gold medal in the over 65s, we were an over-70s team and I don't think we were ever going to beat them because of that age difference. 
But the whole thing is, you know, we're not going to win everything. Surely we have to accept transgendered people into community sport. Mm -hmm. I have a different opinion if it was something like a world championship and the and and Olympics and Commonwealth Games where I think there is such an advantage mm -hmm. at um, or can be an advantage with transgender um, male to female competitors. But yeah. at a community level, um, you know, this is not a sheep station we're playing for and it doesn't, it's not going to affect sponsorship and it's not going to affect earning rights, we're not competing for money, et cetera. But, but as I said, we still take it pretty competitive. <laughs> <laughs> the female competitors were not happy having, you know, a transgender person against them. Yeah. Anyway. And I think that's... We'll get used to that. It's that that's it. It's something that's, you know, in it's kind of relatively new to sport and it's probably going to change. And I like what you said in terms of the community mm. sport because we're all in the community level of sport just because we love it so they should be able to play mm. at a community level they should be free you know to join in teams because that you know everyone deserves mm. the same benefits that we all you know mm. get from playing sport yeah I love that actually I'm going to ask you about a specific one when you were a mum you started a community project where you were running like fitness classes in a hall you correct me where, where I go wrong here and you you wanted to like help <laughs> I, yeah, I did that here at Panton Hill. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, in the 70s, living and learning centres yeah. were established around um, Nellie Big Show. There's one at Elson, one at Panton Hill and one at Diamond Creek. And they, they, they're still going. And they're fabulous places to, to do craft, arts, certificate courses, technology courses, gardening, whatever. The one that was started here, I went there to learn pottery. My first course was pottery after I had baby number one. Yeah. So I'd take her with me to my pottery course <laughs> and then advanced to mud brick making and lamb shed making and spinning and weaving and what have you. But you give back. The thing is to give back to the living and learning centre in those days. Everything yep. was free. And you return by doing volunteer work. So I ran a patchwork course. I learned basic patchwork and I still like patchwork. Um, you know, the people come to my house and do the patchwork. But then I started fitness classes up in the hall. Yeah. Very basic, very basic equipment. Um, I'd run the people down to my property, <laughs> run them around the paddocks, swim them in the dam. <laughs> we didn't have a swimming pool in those days run them back up the hall, do some more exercises. Um, yeah. And then I was going to do, when they started kinder gym, mm -hmm. and I was pregnant with the fourth baby, and I thought, well, that's something I can do with babies and, you know, just bring mine with me. So with another neighbour, we really investigated kinder gym to start, but then um, we moved to Canberra and it never developed. Yep. But um, kinder gym type concepts are still going everywhere and I've had some of my grandchildren do that and I take them to it and it's a great concept. And um, Yeah, I've heard some of the parents of the kids that I like that are at the swim school, they go to kinder gym on some days. They're like, no, I can't do a lesson on Wednesday. I've got kinder gym and I'm like, oh, okay, no worries. So, yeah, like I do love that concept and I guess where I was going with that um, that question is, I think something that you did at your local community because you were, you know, a new mum and you wanted to give back is just as amazing as what you have, you know, established clubs and been presidents of associations. Like I think they're yeah. all incredible and, you know, you're helping so many people. And, yeah, just that, that's where I was going with that. Well, one of the, the – another legacy that's lived on, I was secretary of the school council. I actually been very good with government grants over the year and I got a few government grants for the school. And one of those grants was in the International Year of the Child, which mm -hmm. I think was about 1970-something. And I started the Panton Hill Family Festival. Oh, wow. And, um, which, again, was very much based on sporting themes. So I approached the football club, the, the club, the fire brigade, <laughs> the tennis club. I'd always started basketball at the school for the for girls 
And so over this weekend, all the community groups, I got it, I asked them to put on an event. Yep. So we come and try this or um, come to the kinder and finger paint or whatever, you know. So we all, there was a timetable and we advertised and we put up banners and things and it was all free because I had the grant from the International Union of the Trial Grade. Anyway, that was so successful, it's still running. <laughs> and, uh, That's amazing. I think there was a lull when I was interstate, and then we came back here in two thousand and four. It was it's down to one day of the year in October, the last Sunday in October, and it's called the Festival on the Hill. Oh. And you know it, it's morphed into a different type of festival, and but it, it's still going, and we have dog jumping on the oval. And the fire brigades around with its trucks and the school has things going in the preschool and the church has something going. And, um, yeah, and there's lots of, um, you know, coffee machines and food trucks set up around the streets. And, yeah, but it's still going. Once oh. a year we, we have the Panton Hill Festival. Oh, what a legacy. We might uh, have to make the drive up. And if there's dog jumping, I, I saw Harry leap over a garden bed the other day. So he's he's into it. <laughs> I'll tell you now, Labradors don't win. <laughs> oh, okay. Kelpies. <laughs> or maybe he can just look pretty. <laughs> but they do have um, different categories. Yeah, but it's, it's amazing. I've never seen it before and it started a couple of years ago and now it's about the major feature and everyone gets up on the oval and, and the dog's just amazing. You know, they're, they're jumping over two metres. What? And, um, what? Yeah. God. Yeah. yeah. No, He's definitely not that they, talented. <laughs> no, no. It, it, it's, 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 if it was something in the water, I think the Labradors might win, but um certainly not the jumping event <laughs> yeah okay well maybe maybe we'll just watch that one <laughs> yeah now what do you do outside of sport because you know being in sport and community is very big in your life and I know the answer because um, I have two beautiful products of it lying on my floor <laughs> flooring right now <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> what do you love outside of sport um, I love where I live, mm -hmm. but I always have, you know, you make the most of where you live because we were here for 10 years, then in Canberra for nine, in Sydney for 12, and then back here since 2004. This is a hobby farm. Yeah. So I've got lots of garden, lots of fruit trees, lots of vegetable garden, herbs, a little herd of cows, seven mm -hmm. cows out there in the paddocks. Two cats, three dogs, and 16 chooks. They, that keeps you going. Yes. Um, but in saying that, you always got something to do outside. There's always a branch falls off a gum tree that needs chainsawing up and cutting up for firewood. There's, all, there's weed management in the paddocks. I cook everything you know, <laughs> because you produce a lot of tomatoes, whatever, beans, um, Quinces, I've just made quince paste. You know, I cook from scratch. And again, because of where you live, it's not like there's a shop around the corner. Mm -hmm. So you, you just can't out and buy pizza or anything. So you always you cook all your own meals, basically. Yeah. And I like craft activities. You know, that, again, the benefit of where we live with the Living and Learning Centre. I don't spin much anymore. The grandchildren don't want woolen jumpers anymore or woolen <laughs> scarves, so they're all too itchy and and done a lot of cross-stitch. Mm -hmm. In COVID, I did some cross-stitch. And in COVID lockdown, I produced teddy bears for the um, Red Cross. Mm -hmm. Did a lot of knitting. Um, now I'm knitting at night I knit. I always do something at night when the television's on. Um, I'm knitting blankets, just big square blankets, which are very easy to knit while you watch and talk, for the Royal Women's Hospital. And oh. a friend of mine from the gym, she knits the little bonnets for, yeah. um, for Mitchell babies. Yeah, so I'm babies. just doing the blankets to go around them. Oh, that's so and, lovely. Um, yeah, and, and, yeah, she does the bonnets, so I'll do the blankets. So, And I've got lots of wool here that I can knit up, and, again, it's... It's easy stuff, but 
I don't like not doing anything. Yeah. And, and on my committee, my three committees I'm on at the moment, um, there's committee meetings, and particularly with my Episcopo, the International Association for Physical Education and Sport for Girls and Women. Yeah. I'm the communications director. Mm-hmm. I produce a newsletter, a 20-page plus newsletter every two months. Oh, wow. And we have a World Congress coming up in China in September. So that is really, we're still, we've defined our program. We're now writing to keynotes and panellists for that. So there's emails every day um, going around the world. Our president's in Venezuela, one vice president's in Brazil, the other vice president's in Vienna, secretary's in Miami, and I'm in Melbourne. Wow. So that's our core group. And um, um, we're very busy planning that and working with the Chinese. It's Taizhang University of Sport. Yeah. They're, they're co-hosting that. They, and it'll be a hybrid World Congress so that um, Chinese who can go there, but internationals will be on the Zoom platform. Online. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I did look up their website before we jumped on this Zoom. So I'll have to link their website in the show notes. So if any listeners are interested in that, they can find they can yes. find that organization. Yeah. That's amazing. And we, we share something other than sport in common and yeah. it's our love for Labradors. What yeah. you know, how did you how did you decide you loved Labradors? Well, I think because I grew up in Melbourne Fire Station, Dad ended up deputy chief, and we lived on site. That's, that was my home until I got married. Uh, so for 25 years, I lived in a fire station, and husband's father was in the U.S. Army and then in the federal government in Washington, D.C., and they couldn't have anything other than a cat mm. growing up. And so when we bought this property at Panton Hill, we'd only been here, I think, a few months, and we both wanted a dog. And the first dog we got was a Labrador, Solly, S-O-L-I, <laughs> and that was a most amazing dog. And it was like our child, mm-hmm. as you can imagine. Solly was just beautiful. And so after a couple of years, I decided to breed her because she was such a good dog. And again, like this would be in the early 70s. And we've always had a Labrador or two since. Yeah. And they're just part of our family. They're part of our lifestyle. You just do anything for them. Mm-hmm. Was this before you had your first Labrador, before you had kids? Is that? Children, yes, yeah. Yeah, yeah no, no, we've, we've always had them. And, um, and they're all different. Every dog has a different personality. Mm-hmm. And, no, you love them to death and they're, they're just part of our extended family and you'd do anything for them. You'd absolutely ruin them. But <laughs> they're trained Labradors too. I think that's the difference. Uh, um, they're easy to train. Yeah. They? You know, like they, they're they not a dog that oh, is, they've got just great temperaments. They're a great family dog and therefore we've had them through babies, through grandchildren, around the cows, you know, the cats are friendly with them. Yeah. <laughs> they don't eat the chooks. <laughs> oh, you, what, what, yours don't eat the chooks? Ours do. <laughs> yeah. Do they? Yes. <laughs> no, ours I'm allowed to eat the chooks. So look, I got Coco back from my son. She went, put her on the plane. Coco went up to Queensland and then Ian picked her up and took to his farm in New South Wales. But when he sold the farm, I got Coco back. And he had um, free-range chooks yep. that she wasn't allowed to eat. But if anything died, I think he fed her chicken, mm-hmm. you know, like instead of wasting the carcass, the dog's got some chicken. Yeah. So when we, when I first got her back, she, she mouthed a few of the chooks. Unfortunately, you know, I free-ranged them after lunch. I was out there and caught her, but... Um, she had to be trained out of it because I think she thought this was just her chicken lunch walking by. Yep. <laughs> um, but no, she's she's just got a great temperament, and, and she's, she's Harry's mum, Coco. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. And oh. she she doesn't do that now. <laughs> but she's caught rabbits. 
he catches rabbits here. All mine have caught a rabbit or two over the time. Yeah. And um, mainly baby rabbits out in the paddocks. And, yeah, but, no, they're good around wildlife. They know not to chase the kangaroos. They're just lovely dogs. They are and, the best. Uh, I know you feel the same, Fiona. <laughs> We're almost done. We'll, we'll get on to the last question. And it, I'm sorry, but it's a big question. Where do you see the future of sport? More commercialised, unfortunately. More money involved. And you're a traditionalist to a fair degree. And I like to think that, well, I'd it for Essendon. You know, <laughs> Dad played with Melbourne. If you're going to play with Essendon, you should stay there for life. <laughs> Uh, you know, you just see this in all sports. People go where the money is. The coaches go where the money is. Sponsors go with the winners. Yeah, and that, in that some ways, I think, weakens the values of sport. Yeah. But, you know, again, that's a reflection on my age where you always played without being paid. You hardly got a thing. You paid for everything or your uniform. You, you know, you you. To play in the Australian Championship, you've paid the money for our kids. You always just paid for them. That's still the same in community sport and junior sport. But in professional sport, the, the, probably the good thing with that is that there's more opportunities for girls and women. Yeah. You know, what we have to improve is still the media coverage. The language of journalism at times is still degrading to women. And the photography can still be degrading to women. Mm-hmm. But it has improved, certainly since my years of advocacy. And there's just more money, Fiona, all yeah. the way through, which just changes the dynamics of whatever it is. Yeah, it stops and, it from um, being a game and so, like something that you love. And the, I guess the pureness of sport and kind of changes it more so towards the entertainment side. And a business. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a business of entertainment and, and, and professional athletes know that and say that, that they are in, in the world of entertainment now. But I think the beauty of sport is it's unpredictable. Yeah. You know, you, you look at a builder and they're going to build a house or a factory or a high rise. Well, you know how it's going to turn out. You know, there's the plans and if something goes wrong, it's going to look like what you start doing. Yeah. The thing about sport is it's once you get on the field of play, anything can happen. Yeah. And, and it's got and it's got that emotion behind it. Can you okay. see any difference today to like I guess I'm very young to the world of sport. I, like it's been mm. all like green, as you say. Like it's only been, I've only been involved in it maybe 10 years. I have seen a change for I don't know, I think it's got to change a little bit like the values of sport need to be defined as to where we want it to go and what we want to put above maybe sponsorships Mm. and money and the commercial side like do we want to make it a business of entertainment or do we want it to be about the best athletes competing Mm. but yeah like I guess when you look back in history like it's come a long way and it like I am excited about the future of sport because there's so many different ideas floating around mm. these days and people aren't afraid to speak up like you were, you know, you would speak up for years and years and advocate for what you believed in. Like there's people out there, the game changers doing that now. And I think, you know, mm. the more conversations we have about it, the, the better the outcome will yeah. be. That's certainly happening. And, and people are using sport as a platform. Yeah. And that's exactly, you know, reading Megan Rapinoe's book, how she realised, you know, in the mid-2015, 16, because she was an Olympian with her personality, the media was attracted to her. Mm-hmm. That this gave her a platform where she was recognised. And after they won the World Cup twice, etc., and there was such a huge following on television, that didn't translate into fans at grounds or into pay for mm. them. But she was able to use her platform to bring about change and to stand up to USA soccer to improve their conditions and eventually their pay. And this is what is happening with um, Naomi Osaka, tennis, etc. Um, 
people are using that sporting platform to speak out on well, other issues of gender equality, basically, and even just issues of equality, not gender, just the equality issues with racism and um, bullying, et cetera, um, across society. So I think that's a good thing about sport. And sometimes, you know, there, there's reaction against that, and, and, and that, that's happened where some of those athletes have then been punished for speaking out in various ways through their sports administrators. And it'll be interesting to see what happens at the Tokyo Olympics because the IOC has now brought in a policy that you must stand on the dais for um, medal winners. Oh, is that because of some certain swimmers that didn't do that? Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. And, um, and he's, he's come out and said he won't do that. So, you know, these issues of um, cheating, this is, this is not a quality issue, but it's... it's, it's doping and sport issue yeah um, he's making a strong stance and 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 demonstrated in that way so I think that that's a good thing about sport because then it brings forward these issues and FINA doesn't have a great record in drug testing Mm -hmm. indeed FINA's in a position of scandal at the moment with its president and its finances so um it's, it's, it's an interesting situation that um, athletes are getting, some of them are taking their platform and their profiles to a level of public discussion on major community issues. And I don't have a problem with that. Mm-hmm. It's, um, but again, sports administrators will because they don't know how to handle it. And it's, it's, it's relatively new. Yeah. Yeah, that's um, it. It's it's foreign territory and they're like, well, how do we yeah. deal with this? What do we yeah, do? Yeah. 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 And we've had a few cases in Australia, Israel to Lou, you know, with um, rugby, et cetera. And, uh, and I think that will continue on across various things. We'll, we'll always have sport because the values of sport, I think, override the not-so-good values that can come through sport. That's it. You know, that's there, there can be drug taking, there can be cheating, there can be bullying, there can be all these yeah, harassment, etc. But sports have generally identified that. It, we've got policies to act on in the, all those regards. Yeah, we just got to keep ahead of the checks. Mm-hmm. And I think the whole Tokyo Olympics is going to be interesting anyway in the whole era yeah. that we're living in right now with COVID. But yeah, like I know my future sister-in-law, Brooke Stratton, is a long jumper. Oh, so yeah. like just seeing that, you know, her fiancé Nathan, who is going to be my brother-in-law, he might not be able to go over to watch her. No. And like no. that that kind of dynamic and then like the support crew and just, yeah, the whole no crowds or how's that affect sponsorship. If it's going to be a commercial business, then mm-hmm. there's no crowds coming in and that's why you know major cities want to host olympics is for the yeah. for the revenue so yeah it's it's going to be a very interesting space i think in the next next five years yeah i, I feel really sorry for the japanese country people and the government and the olympic committee that have put so much money into these games mm-hmm. and they would do it very well with the level of organisation, any events I've gone to in Japan have been superbly run and administrated. So I, I just feel so sorry that these games will be so affected by COVID. Yeah. And, and you know, there's, there's still a chance they won't go ahead. With, they're in their fourth wave mm-hmm. or their sixth wave, whatever. <laughs> and, and the numbers just keep getting worse out of, out of Tokyo too. You just hope they all go well. The value of the Olympic Games has gone down. There's no doubt about that because Mm -hmm. it's just getting harder and harder. And the security, we haven't even touched on security. The the Com Games in the North Coast 2018, husband was on the organising committee. The actual figure, but it was sort of almost as much as running the games. Wow, just they were were low key games. Yeah. The threat, the possible threat is there. And so, you know, I think we forgot about terrorism because of COVID. Mm. But that is one of the major worries now with world events. And it is a factor in hosting any of these games. So 
We'll see how Tokyo, Tokyo goes and then it's Birmingham next year for the Commonwealth Games, mm -hmm. which are not as big. I think there's only, it's about 6,000 athletes for Com Games where it's 10,000 for Olympics. But still, they're big multi-sport games. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're harder ones to deliver on than uh, a world championship or a single sport game. Mm -hmm. So they're going to be interesting games to watch too after um, Tokyo. Yeah, definitely. Well, yeah. thank you very, very much for coming on, Janice. I really, really appreciate it. Well, it's been fun to talk to you and much enjoyed and reminiscing here over the good old days. Thank you for listening to this episode of Beyond Sport with Fiona Stewart. This is a completely independent podcast that has been created to share the journey and lessons of top level sporting professionals, but also your everyday lover of sport. If you liked this podcast, I'd really appreciate if you could leave a review and share it with someone who you think would also enjoy it. Until next time. <laughs>